All right, here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, we'll be focusing in kind of in the middle of the, the chapter here, starting in verse number 10. I want to call your attention here. Paul reads, For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. This is some of the people at Corinth. The, the church at Corinth had a lot of problems. As you're reading through the Bible, especially in the New Testament, you know, there's, there's, different, there's a different feel for the different epistles that Paul was writing. He's writing to different churches, you know, a church in Galatia, a church at Corinth, the church at Ephesus, you know, all these various places he was sending out his, his writings and his teachings to. And Corinth, he, we've got two epistles to Corinth, and most of it is, is pretty negative on the things that they're doing. You know, they're, they've got a lot of things screwed up. And we can see here that there are people there that are saying, oh yeah, when he writes to us, you know, his words are weighty and they're powerful, right? He's speaking and, 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 and writing to us with, with this authority and, and it is powerful, praise God, right? He's writing to them God's word because God's word is powerful. But they're saying that, yeah, his letters are weighty and powerful, but when his, his bodily presence here, he's just weak. He's just some weakling. His speech is contemptible. You know, he's really not not who he is through his letters. He's way weaker. He's, you know, he's just this guy that we don't have to respect at all. It's basically this type of attitude that they have towards the Apostle Paul. This is what's kind of going around at that area where people are, are not treating the Apostle Paul with the respect that they ought to have and are kind of getting puffed up in their own minds. Look at verse number 11. It says, Let such an one think this. So, so people who are saying that, let them think this. This is what Paul's answer is. That such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also in deed when we are present. It's in the same way that we are when we're writing these letters unto you. Guess what, guys? It's going to be the same way when I show up. It's going to be the same way in action. And the title of my sermon th this evening is In Word and in Deed. We need to be living our lives as Christians that it's not just lip service. It's not just things that we say. It's not just, oh yeah, I believe this or I believe that. But it's things that we actually do. It's not just words. There's actions that go along with those words. That's what makes it a real religion. That's what makes it uh, um, valid to even you know, go out and preach and say anything when you're following that up with action. That's what makes you not a hypocrite. And that's what they're doing. They're basically calling the Apostle Paul a hypocrite. That, oh yeah, he sounds real big and tough and strong and mighty and powerful when he's, you know, way over in some other city and he's writing to us. But when he gets here, he's just going to be weak. And he's saying, let it be known, okay? The same way that I'm writing to you now is the way that I'm going to be when I show up. And that's the type of attitude that we ought to have. You know, with just, in just our speech in general, obviously he's dealing with a problem at a church, but the things that we say, they ought to be followed completely in line with the things that we do. Let's keep reading here because he goes on and, and it kind of expounds a little bit more on some of the problem that they're having here. He says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. So what he's saying here is that I'm not going to compare myself among those that commend themselves. What are they doing? When they commend themselves, they're, they're giving themselves honor. They're giving themselves glory. The commendation should be coming from other people. You shouldn't be lifting yourself. And that's what's so funny about like, you know, just watching presidential or any elections for that matter. You know, these politicians are always talking about how great they are, right? I'm so great. I'm this good. I've done this. And, I've done, you know, and they're all just boasting of all their accolades and stuff when a... a, a a godly attitude is one where you're humble and meek and you're not proud and boastful and you let other people do the, do the commending for you. And just on, real briefly on the, on the subject of politicians, I wasn't around during the foundation of this country. Obviously, I'm not that old. But um, from some of the things that I've read, I've read that, that many of the men didn't really want the office of the presidency at all. 
that they were humble men, that they took the office. And I think publicly they would say the, you know, oh, you know, like, I don't really want it. And other people would put up the platform and, and, and do the, the legwork and support them and say, hey, we should elect this person. And they did all the work and, and, and they were commending someone that they believed would be a very good person to be in that position, but the, the candidate themselves weren't you know, going around and boasting of themselves. That's a godly attitude to have. That, I mean, that's the way things ought to be in general, whether you're running for politics or not. I mean, that should just be, you, you know, no one should be walking around saying how great they are. I mean, that's kind of like the pharisaical attitude of the, you know, of the or the, the, these days with religion, you know, people saying how many PhDs they have and, and I'm, a, I'm a master in, in the studies of theology and all, you know, boasting of their educations and, and all this other stuff. It's like, why don't you just compare yourself to God's standard? And see, what he's saying that there's people like that. He's like, I'm not going to compare myself to them, compare myself to them. He says, but they, what they do, they measure themselves by themselves. So they're in their little group and they're comparing themselves with each other, saying who's better than the other one, right? And he's saying, I'm not going to get caught up in that. I'm not going to get caught up in saying, oh, well, I do this and this person doesn't do that, so I'm better than them. He says, they com measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. There's many reasons why that's not wise. To just be in your small group and, and start comparing yourself basically as, as who's the best Christian in our, in our group here, right? For one, it's very possible that the bar is set really low. <laughs> you might be, you know, the, 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 the biggest fish in that small little pond. But when you're, when, when that, if that's what you're using to dictate your spirituality, you're coming up way short, okay? Because God's measure, and that's what he says in verse 13, but we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, the rule, the standard, right? The measurement that God has. It's his rule. He, he's the one that, that we are supposed to be measuring up against. You know, it's, it's his words. It's, it's in his word that dictates how well we are doing. So it doesn't matter how well you're doing comparatively in this lifetime. What matters is how do you measure up to God's word and the God's standard? Don't set your standard of all the people around you, the people in your church or the people that you communicate with or whatever. The standard is in God's word. That is where we should be measuring to determine how well we're doing in this life, how well we're doing spiritually. And that will keep you very humble, by the way. That will keep you very humble when you're using God's measure. Because when you start really looking and digging in this book, you're going to realize I am far from arriving at the, you know, being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Amen. Got a long way to go. When you compare yourself among yourselves, you might start thinking a lot higher. Oh, well, this person doesn't read their Bible every day. I do. This person doesn't go out soul winning. I do. This, you know, and, and you start getting puffed up real easily when you have that type of a, of a mindset. Now, I would think, you know, imagine a church where everyone was doing this, which it's, and I don't think everyone was doing this at the church at Corinth. I don't think it was the entire church. But whatever the church is, every church has their problems. If people start doing this in a church that had a serious problem in an area, let's say, for example, like soul winning, like no one in the church was going out and preaching the gospel to anybody, right? But everybody in that church is, is comparing themselves among each other, saying, you know, like, I do all this study, I do all this, I do all that. And it's like, yeah, but you all have this big glaring problem of not even fulfilling the Great Commission in any capacity whatsoever. Like, that's why it's not wise to just compare yourselves among yourselves. But we should be using God's measure. And he said, you know, he says, our measure has reached all the way even unto you. Why? Because the Apostle Paul went around and covered a lot. And measure, he's literally talking about, like, distance when he's using this word measure because he has covered a lot of ground in his preaching. He has gone, he went, he, he covered a lot of uh, geographic area and, and preached the gospel all over the place because God led him. He won these people to Christ. He was helping churches get established and he was saying, we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure 
as though we reach not unto you. So when, when Paul's writing to them and telling them all these things, he's like, we're not going above and beyond our power here or our measure. Look, we made it all the way out to you. We preach the gospel from here all the way out to you. We are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, he said in verse 14. Verse 15, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, you know, things that, that the Apostle Paul had done and, and those men with him, because it wasn't just him by himself. He had other people that were helping him out and, and fellow laborers all along the way. He says, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to your rule abundantly, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. And this is another area that we ought to take to heart. <clears throat> and it's not riding on the coattails of other people that do the work and, and, and glorying in other people's work, right? Like, like as if you had did it, had done it, excuse me. This happens often too. When, when you get in a really zealous church and people are on fire and it's, and it's one of these, you know, all kinds of stuff is happening. People are going out and preaching and, and, and winning souls and all this other stuff. And you might get some people in there that will basically start to, to talk bad about other churches saying that like, oh yeah, you know, our church, we do all this soul winning, we do all this other stuff. And these churches are lame. They don't do any of that stuff. And it's like the person saying that doesn't go soul winning themselves. Okay, and they're boasting of the other people in the church that are going out and doing this stuff. It's like, wait a minute. Don't go boasting in, in other people's labors. You know, if you're going to say anything at all, if you're going to make any comments like that at all, you ought to be the one out doing that. You know, if you're going to be talking that type of a talk of saying, yeah, these people are all wrong because they're not doing this and they're not doing that, are you doing that? Hey, it's one thing if, if you are doing that, okay? Then, then you actually have some room to speak. If you're sh proving by your actions the words that you're saying, they're going to have a lot more weight and a lot more meaning than if you're spouting off your mouth, but you're not doing the things. Take that to heart. We need to, we need to remember that because, and, and this is, I think, one of the biggest problems in general in the Independent Fundamental Baptist movement is... is a pride issue because there's there's such a dearth of, of sound doctrinal teaching in general in churchianity I, lo I love that phrase that you use out there churchianity right just your, your your broad Christian churches out there there's such a lack of depth there's such a lack of just sound doctrine it's, it's a lot of the same milk toast sermons just week after week after week with not very much meat being taught ever on anything not even necessarily heresies just just not much of anything being taught so when people get turned on to to a church that's that's you know there's a lot of preaching being done the people are on fire a lot of people are doing all kinds of works for the lord i've seen this happen time and time and time again where people who are new to that Start getting very arrogant and very pride, proudful, uh, proud, so prideful or proud. <laughs> Man, my grammar is terrible tonight. Excuse me for that. People start getting very proud, and they start, you know, bagging on all these other people. I've heard people saying, you know, this, you know, pastor so and so is an idiot. He doesn't know anything. And talking about uh, pastors of churches that actually do go, that actually do go work, that actually, you know, the guy's saved, and the guy's been pastoring a church for maybe 20 or 40 years or whatever, and he may be soft on some doctrine, which, which, okay, yeah, he shouldn't be, but when you go around boasting, oh, yeah, he doesn't know anything, yeah, the guy's been saved for like 50 or 60 years, and has been working for the Lord for a really long time, don't go around saying he doesn't know anything. Amen. Because that's not true. I mean, it, and again, I'm not, I know I'm not bringing, giving you a specific situation, but I've seen it happen too many times where that was the case, where it was somebody who's, a little, you know, not everyone's going to agree with the stands that we take. And I get that. And you know what? They're wrong. <laughs> because we've got all the right doctrine here. And anything else, you know, someone else believes, they're wrong. But 
<laughs> but we don't need to be all proud and lifted up. Obviously, you could tell I'm joking, but you know, it's not something that that you are now all of a sudden just just gonna you know, as a new Christian, as someone who's who got saved six months ago and all of a sudden started hearing all this truth being preached, which. That's great because it's not being preached anywhere else. Then all of a sudden think you just know more than all these other people. I, I've heard of people going into these churches and kind of starting a lot of problems over doctrines. Like, for example, the pre-tribulation rapture, right? Because that's something that's real commonly taught in many Baptist churches. In many churches, not even just Baptist, but just many churches that are Christian churches. It's a popular doctrine. And it's kind of like, you know, you don't have to call the, the pastor an idiot because he doesn't agree with you. Right. Now, I think they're wrong. I mean, I, you know where we stand. We're post-trib pre-wrath. Right. And, and I think that's correct. And I think that's doctrinally sound. And I, and I haven't heard any convincing arguments to the, to, the, to the contrary of that. I've never heard anybody even attempt to really give any good refutation or, or answers to why they believe in a pre-trib rapture. I, I haven't. I've seen people try to give answers and, and it's just doesn't make any sense. It's like mental gymnastics trying to, trying to get anything across. Or it's people involved with other false doctrines of like dispensationalism and, and Zionism and, and um, you know, or maybe using false versions, things like that. There, there's other things that get kind of hooked into that, that same belief. But it doesn't mean that they're idiots. Right? It doesn't mean that they're not doing a good work for God. And we need to remember that and make sure to keep ourselves in check. And we don't need to compare ourselves to what they're doing. Right. Don't worry about that. Don't feel all lifted up and like, oh, I know so much more than all these pastors know. Why are you comparing yourself to them anyways? Why don't you compare yourself to God's measure? Amen. That'll keep you humble. Yeah. And, as, and, as, and as, as, as much as you may think you know... Let's keep ourselves according to God's measure. And, and that'll keep us in check. We preach what we know and believe it and, and, and wholeheartedly accept it. And you know what? Other people believe whatever they want. That's why we're an independent Baptist church. We're independent from everybody else. We're going to believe what we say that this book says and, and Jesus Christ is our head. <clears throat> Turn, if you would, to... 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, right near the end of the Bible there. You have 1 and 2 Peter, 1, 2 and 3 John. 1 John chapter number 3. Getting back to the theme of the sermon, we want to live... Not just by our word. We want, we want to be people that, that can speak and follow through with the action. The things that we say we ought to be doing. We ought to be following that up. Be living in word and in deed. 1 John chapter 3, look at verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And now turn, if you would, to James chapter 2. You see, it's easy to tell someone that you love them, right? Those words come out of people's mouths all the time, saying, oh yeah, I love you, oh I love you, brother, I love you, sister. But then when the rubber meets the road, when there comes an instance where that person's in need, that person's in trouble, what ends up happening? In many cases, nothing. Those actions speak louder than words. And that's a true statement. Your actions will speak louder than your words. The Bible says here, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And that's why he brings up there in verse 17, but whoso hath this world's good. God has given you good. God has given you some kind of wealth, right? But whoso, if you have this world's good and you see that your brother has a need, you see someone in trouble, you see someone that is just completely down and out, they're struggling, they have a need, you've got wealth, you've got whatever, God's blessed you. It says, and you shut up your bowels of compassion from him. Just let him suffer. I'm going to keep what I have to myself. He says, how dwelleth the love of God in you? How can you say that, that you've got the love of God 
when you're shutting up your compassion from a brother, from a brother in Christ that, that, is, that is in you know, a tremendous amount of need or whatever the case may be here that it's referring to. Someone that's in need, you can help them, but you decide not to. James chapter 2, we're going to see the same exact thing. And hopefully this will help people to understand. If you, if you, if you had any problems understanding James chapter 2, it's, it's, it tends to be a more difficult passage for Christians to understand. I think mostly because of so much false doctrine that's been taught about this chapter that it kind of gets stuck in your head. There's a way of thinking that people will, will take you down this path that it's hard to undo that, that training if you've, been, if you've been hearing the false doctrines in James chapter 2. That, um, so that many people teach basically a works-based salvation here. That it's faith plus works for your salvation. And um, that's not, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Of course, of course that would be contradictory to like every other verse in the Bible. Yep. But not that. It, it, it's, not, it's not that alone. It's not even what this is teaching here. But let's, let's look and see at this because this, this ties in perfectly <laughs> with the indeed and in word, your, in your words following with your actions. Uh, James 2, we're going to start reading in verse number 14. What doth it profit, my brethren? And again, there, my brethren. He's speaking to people who are already saved. He's talking to people like, what is a profit? What good is it? What, what is a profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? So the, the first of all, it's just a, it's a question. What good is it? What good does it do? If you say you have faith and you're not doing anything, you're not acting on it, what, good, what is the profit? And you know what the answer is? Nothing. There is no profit because you're not doing anything. Right? It says, can faith save him? Now, first of all, look, that's a question. Can faith save Does it say he is not saved then just by faith? It doesn't say that. It says, can faith save him? And again, in the context, saved from what? Right? Let's keep reading here. Verse number 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. So here's someone that comes to you, a brother or sister in Christ. They're naked and they don't even have their food. Right? They don't have food. They don't have sufficient clothing. That's a need. That's a serious need, right? Someone comes to you and you say, Depart in peace. You know, they come to you looking for help. Hey, be warmed, be filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? That's what he's likely to, saying, someone comes to you, they need clothing, they need food, and you just say, hey, be full, be warm. You know, see ya. <laughs> you don't actually do anything for them. You've done nothing because your words are meaningless. It doesn't profit that person at all. They're not going to feel any better. They're not going to feel any warmer or any less hungry because of the words that you spoke to them. You need to do something for them. It says, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. When you're not doing the works, the faith that you have dies. That is a true statement. That is what the Bible says. But what gets ex extrapolated from that is people will then say, well, when your faith dies, then you lose your salvation. Not true. Because otherwise, it's not eternal life. It's not everlasting life, which has gone over many, many times in the Bible. You know, Jesus Christ said himself, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. I mean, it's, it's, it's very simple. But... Um, our faith, in order to have a, a lively faith, we need to be doing the works. We need to be doing the things that God has laid out for us to do because when we don't do any of the works, our faith dies. Verse number 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Again, actions speak louder than words, and that's basically what this person is saying. A man may say, Hey, you, you say you've got faith. Well, I've got works. You know? Show me your faith without works. How do you show somebody your faith? How could you really show somebody your faith in God or your faith in anything without doing some kind of works? You can't do it. There's no way to show someone that it's inside. You can't open up your heart and show them your faith. 
The only way you could show them your faith is by expressing that faith, by doing, that, doing something and taking action. And that's why he says, I'll show you my faith by my works. The works that you do is going to prove what you believe. It's going to show what it is that you hold to be true. Verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And ju just since we're here, it's, it, it's not quite exactly what I'm talking about, but people turn to this and say, oh yeah, see, the devils believe, but they don't, they're not saved because they're not doing the works, right? This is what like the Mormon will tell you, whatever. Well, it says thou believest that there is one God. Is that what salvation is? Do, is it, do all you have to do in order to be saved is believe that there's one God? Is that what saves you? Is that what we go out and tell people? Hey, believe that there's one God and thou shalt be saved. Nope. No, of course not. The Muslims believe there's one God. They call him Allah. Many people that are not Christians at all believe there's one God, believe there's one creator, believe there's one. That doesn't make you saved at all. He's saying, hey, you believe there's one God? You're doing well, because that is, that's true. There is one God, right? He says, you know what? The devils also believe and they tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? So that's not saying that, that the devils believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation, but they're not saved because they're not doing the works. That's not what that says at all. It isn't saying that they believe there's one God. And then he reiterates, faith without works is dead, which I have no problem with that statement. Of course it is. That's what the Bible says. Faith without works is dead. Verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. So now he's saying, now do you start to understand? He's saying, when Abraham offered up Isaac upon the altar, how old was Isaac? He was like 13 years old or something when he was going to offer him up on the, on the altar. Again, is this pointing to Abraham's salvation point that when he finally was told by God to offer up Isaac, his son, on the altar, when he actually went through and was about to do it, that that's when Abraham got saved because his works plus his faith saved him? No. No, of course not. Abraham believed God and it was counted him for righteousness way before, way before in Abraham's life, he put his faith in the Lord and he believed God and he actually took action on those things. When God told him to leave his, his native country and leave his family, you know what? He ended up leaving. God led him and, and led him all over the place and he believed him and he did it. He did according to the things that he believed. But he's bringing up this point of saying, because th this is a very big event in Abraham's life and it really was an expression of Abraham's faith. That Abraham had a very lively faith. That he had a faith that was so strong in the Lord that because God had promised him of his seed that Isaac was going to, to that he was going to have all of these generations of people after him and that Christ was going to come of his seed through the prophecy of the Lord, that God does not fail from his promises, that he says, even if God tells me to kill my son, I know that God can't lie and that God is going to make sure that his word stands, that even if God tells me to kill my son, I could kill him. You know what? He's going to raise him again from the dead because it's going to continue to happen. That's why he told the men, when he was already told that he was supposed to go and offer up his son, he told the men that were waiting by the stuff, he says that we're going off and we're coming back again. That's right. He told them that. He had that faith. He knew what was going to happen. He had, the gospel had been preached to him, had been revealed to him. He knew that there was going to be a sacrifice, that God was going to prepare himself a lamb. He knew that there was coming and what he was doing was demonstrating a future event of God's only begotten son being offered to pay for the sins of the world as a sacrifice for our sin. He knew that. And by following through, it demonstrated his faith. He really did believe all that stuff because he was willing to take it to whatever, you know, to whatever level he had to take it to, to show he actually believed that. Amen. 
And that's what happens in the story. That's how he was justified by works because he demonstrated and made it public that what he was doing was completely um, in line with his faith. When he offered Isaac, says, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the thing, excuse me, the things that you do when you act on your faith, it does complete or perfect your faith. It, it even sometimes helps prove to yourself that you really believe something. You know, when you, when, when you kind of believe something in your, just, just in, uh, in theory, right? Well, in theory, I believe this. In theory, that's what the Bible says. But when you actually follow it through with action, that kind of cements that faith. That really just, just fulfills the, the, the faith that you have. Um, when, when you follow through and actually take action on it. It's no longer just a theoretical thing. It says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. See, Abraham believed God a long time ago, but it was fulfilled. It was finally just demonstrated that, yeah, he truly did believe God. He believed him a long time ago. This just shows and proved, yeah, he did believe God. And then he says in verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. And that's in a very important, you, every word there is important. You see then how, which means in what way by works a man is justified and not by faith only. In what way is a man justified by works and not faith only? In man's eyes in the outward expression, the way the things that other people can see. Nobody can see your heart except for God. God knows your heart. God knows your faith. God doesn't need to see your actions to know whether or not you have faith, to know whether or not you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. God knows that. But that's why earlier in the same exact chapter, it brings up a person who doesn't have clothing, doesn't have food. When you actually do something for them, that demonstrates to that person outwardly what you believe when you actually help them. That, that shows your faith. That shows what you believe. We are justified in man's eyes. That's why in Romans chapter 4, it's critical to go back and forth. And you know what? If you want, you can flip there real quick. I, I wasn't planning on this, but it, it's an important enough topic, an important enough false doctrine that's being taught to understand the Scripture. You need to compare the Scripture with Scripture. And I've done this in, in, in another sermon where we've gone through all these examples where, where you find in Genesis, you find in Romans 4, and you find it here in James chapter 2, the event, the specific event of Abraham believing God and being imputed to him for righteousness. And look at verse number 4, or, or I mean verse number 1 of chapter 4 of Romans. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory but not before God. So if Abraham was justified by his works, he can glory in that, right? Among people, among men, in the eyes of other people. He would be justified in other people's eyes, but not before God. So his works aren't going to say, you know, his works aren't going to judge him. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. But to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And it goes on and on. Great chapter about salvation, our eternal salvation, being by grace through faith. And this is not contradictory to James chapter 2. It's complementary to James chapter 2. It illustrates the fact that Abraham, his soul was saved by faith. But the demonstration of his faith was made when he went through or was about to go through with the sacrifice of Isaac, his son. It showed, it made it public what his faith is. And in a sense, that's kind of what we do when we get baptized. We're, what we're doing is it's an outward demonstration of our faith. It's this outward manifestation saying, well, you say you have faith. Well, yeah, I also got baptized. I mean, Right in front of the whole church, in front of everybody, I stated, this is what I believe. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is why we go get dunked under the water and come back up again to show that picture 
of Jesus Christ dying on the cross. It's an outward manifestation, an outward expression of your faith. But we need to beware that, that our faith doesn't die. Because it can die. Your salvation is never going to go away. God's never going to leave you or forsake you. But your salvation can die. I mean, your faith can die. <clears throat> Judge in yourselves how spiritual your talk is. The things that you say. Right? The things that you talk about. The things that you say you believe. The things that you say just in general you know, about the Bible or anything that has to do with, with you know, spiritual things. You know, sure, you come to church. You may know a lot of things from the Bible. You might have that knowledge and that wisdom. You may talk about them and complain about how everyone else is it wrong, but what are you actually doing? And, and this is something that goes hand in hand with this morning's sermon. Getting things done can be so difficult. People have all kinds of things going on in their life. And as I was, I was pointing out this morning, you know, you got to decide what's important. What do, you, what do you want to look back on your life and say, what have you accomplished? What have you done? Getting up and doing actions and actually taking part in doing things is very, very difficult. We need to make sure we're not spiritual hypocrites where we just say we believe all these things. Say believe that. And I was a big hypocrite for a long time. And you know what? It bothered me. And it prevented me from doing anything from God, actually. It made me get to the point where I doubted my salvation. I brought this up in the past, but after I got saved and I was still going out and partying and drinking and stuff, I knew that drinking was wrong because I'd already seen that in the Bible. It's not, it doesn't take very much. There's quite a, quite a few verses on that. Getting drunk, drunkenness is a sin. It's a very big sin. It's not, it's not something taken lightly in the Bible. I knew it was wrong, but I did it anyways. And, and I would continue to do this. And then one day I was just thinking, I was just like, man, you know, I claim to believe the Bible because I really did in my heart. You know, I had gotten saved. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I believe the Bible so much so that right after I got saved, I had to figure out the whole evolution thing because I had been you know, brainwashed that evolution was true. And I had already decided that I believed the Bible because I put my faith in Christ. So now I had to figure out, well, how does, this, how does this mesh? How does that make sense? You know? And it wasn't that I was even doubting the Bible. I was just trying to figure out what, how, how would, would that even fit in? And that's where my eyes got opened up to, oh, I've just been lied to. You know, it's as simple as that. And, and you start seeing the other real science that, that supports the Bible account of creation, everything like that. But, um, so, so I had my faith in, the, you know, in God's word. But... I started doing, you know, living a different way. My actions did not reflect what I believed at all. I mean, really, I was just, just completely hypocritical. And it got to the point where it was just like, am I even saved? Do I even really believe this? Because I'm not doing this. My faith was dead. Because I wasn't doing anything. I had faith without works. My faith was dead. But it was rekindled. It was brought back. Amen. The moment when I finally got into a good church, when I finally started reading the Bible again, when I finally started doing things and taking action, that's when my faith came back to life. Salvation was there the whole time. God never forsook me. God is still my father. I was never unborn and then born again, unborn, born again. It's not the way it works. Flip back if you would to James chapter 1. Because we, we ought to strive to be part of a true Religion. We saw a lot of shirts yesterday at the Hope Fest. You know, uh, it's a, it's a, what's it? It's a, it's a relationship, not a religion. Something to that effect. You know, you, you, you've seen the phrase over and over and over again, right? That it's, you know, we have a relationship, not a, not a religion. Well, I have a religion. Amen. I do. I don't think religion's a bad word. I don't think it's a curse word. Now, the Bible does warn us about. Uh, about people who are involved in bad religions, about the Pharisee type, a Pharisaical type of religion. But in James chapter 1, at the end of the chapter here, verses 26 and 27, religion is actually used in a positive sense, and there's actually a good religion to have. Verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and brileth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. That's a bad religion, right? It's a, it's a vain religion. It's, 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 it's meaningless. It's, it's pointless. He's not doing anything. He's not briling his tongue. This is his own heart, but look at verse 27. Pure religion. Pure sounds pretty good, right? Pure religion undefiled before God and the Father is this. 
to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That is a good thing. That is a very good thing. That is a religion we ought to have. We ought to be not just believing, hey, it's a good thing to take care of the fatherless and widows. It's a good thing to do that, right? Praise God for the people that do that. And keeping yourself unspotted from the world, like we heard, we heard the, the Christian rapper, the Christian rapper saying that, you know, we're not supposed to be of this world as he's rapping just like the world. <laughs> it's just total irony. But if you say you believe these things and you don't do them, then your religion is vain. This is pure religion. It's a good thing. And it involves works. It involves doing good works. Now look, I have a relationship and a religion. I have a relationship because I'm a son of God. I was born into his family. Praise God for that. He's my dad. That's my relationship. And I want to have a really good relationship with the Father. But I've got a religion too. I'm trying to keep myself unspotted from the world. I, I mean, I, to the best of my ability, that's this, this is what we're trying to do. This is what our church is trying to do. We're trying to keep ourselves unspotted. You know, we, we don't want to get involved in the worldly sins and the, and, the, and, and, the, and the things that the world has to offer. We're trying to keep ourselves from that stuff. But let's not stop at that. The visiting the fatherless and the widows is very important. Now, we do that through the soul winning, but I think this is more than just that. Because it visited the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. This is something I've been wanting to start up for a very long time, for, well, for almost three years now since we started the church. This is something that I used to do back in the other church when I had the time to be able to do this, so visit the, uh, a nursing home, a rest home, visit the fathers, visit the widows, visit the people who literally, if they had any family, they dumped them off in this, in this rest home, this nursing home, where they would oftentimes never come and see them again, or people who didn't have any family. It's really sad. I mean, and this was a real ghetto type of place. The staff wasn't that great. You know, was, they're, they're probably getting paid very, very little. The people were at least four to a room with little curtains and in real bad shape. A lot of people just die there. But those are the people we need to be going out and reaching. That is, I mean, that, that is really a big part of what we're supposed to be doing is going out and reaching those people. The people that no one else cares about. The people whose own family don't care about them. Let's bring the gospel to them. And as I mentioned this morning and I'm mentioning again tonight, we need to be doing more. And you need to evaluate in your life the things that you could do. Until I can leave my regular job and be supported by the church, my time is limited on the things that I could do personally. But you know what? Thank God we've got a great church. We've got a lot of people here. We've got people that, that everyone's in a different situation. But you need to determine for yourself what time you want to spend and devote to serving God. Do you want to have a real religion like the Bible says here? I'm interested in, in people that want to go out and have, we have ministries. I want to be able to reach people in prison. I want to be able to reach people in these nursing homes. I want to reach the fatherless and the widows. I have all kinds of plans in my mind, but I need people to fill those plans. People need to step in and do that stuff. So anyone that's interested in doing anything like that, you know what? It's going to come at a sacrifice. And I mentioned that this morning too. It's a big sacrifice of time. It's an investment of something that you have to be committed to doing. But you have to decide if that is something that you want to do or not. If you want to do it, come to me. I'll help, I'll help guide you and lead you into what, what any of these ministries that, we, that, that I think are going to be very valuable and things that we ought to be doing. But it requires effort. I never want this church to just be a social club. This isn't a place where we just come together, we hang out, hey, we can all talk about how great the Bible is and stuff, but no one ever goes out and does anything. That's not this church. 
We are going to talk about how great the Bible is and how good it is and stuff, but we're going to show that we believe that by doing the things found in this book. That is who we are here at Word of Truth Baptist Church. Anybody, anybody interested in doing more, you say, I want to do more. Come see me. Come see me tonight. See me anytime. Talk to me. Give me a call. I will help you find an area to do some more work in for God. A lot of, and, and look, I know what it's like not to have very much direction. I was led to do the nursing home ministry. I didn't come up with that on my own. My pastor brought me, pulled me aside and said, hey, I think you should do this. I think this would be great for you. I, you know, praise God. He gave me the little push that I needed to actually get up and do something uncomfortable, to do something that required a sacrifice of my time, to do something that, hey, now all of a sudden, week after week, I had to get sermons ready because what I did was I went in these nursing homes and I preached to people. Yes, I went in the rooms, I talked to them, I preached the gospel, but then I also provided like a mini little church service where we sang some songs and I'd give them a little sermon. And they loved it. I mean, the people there, would, 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 they thought it was great. I would bring my kids. I had... I had um, at first, it was just Elizabeth and Elizabeth and Abigail. They loved seeing the kids, man. That brought, you know, just that alone for some of these people brightened up their whole day. We had one lady that would, <laughs> she'd knit socks, and they were like full adult-like socks for our kids. But that's kind of the situation they were in. You know, I mean, they were, you know, mentally, they kind of had some problems. Physically, they had some problems. But, it was, but, but they loved us being there. And, and you know what? We made a difference in a lot of people's lives. And again, I'm... Uh, I'm not, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to, 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 to lift up myself in any way, shape, or form. It's to let you know because you could be a part of doing that type of thing. And that type of work is the most fulfilling work that you can ever do. Reaching people. You know what it's like. Those of you that go out and win souls, that lead people to Christ, you know that's fulfilling. Amen. That's great. That's really fulfilling. You're changing the, the, the eternity of someone. But going out and, and being a blessing in other ways also, in addition to the soul winning, is very fulfilling. And very helpful in things that we need to be doing here. Last place I'll have you turn, Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. <clears throat> Let's get motivated to do more. I'm going to keep preaching out, you know, the book of Acts, my favorite book. The people turned the world upside down. How did they turn the world upside down? They were taking action. That's why it's the book of Acts, because they were doing. This isn't just a, a mental exercise of our faith. This isn't just weighing, well, yes, I believe that, and then, and then everything just stops there. No, no, it's so much more than that. You need to come to the conclusion, yes, I agree with this teaching or this doctrine or whatever, in your head. Now take that to the next step. Matthew 15, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, Then came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother. And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say... Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition, ye hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, look at this, verse 8, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. Let's make sure our hearts are not far from God. Let's not be the Christian who, in our lips, in our words, yeah, we honor God, but in our actions we're doing nothing. Let's be Christians that live in word, and indeed, let's bow our eyes and a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for your words, dear Lord. I pray that you would please 
Get, get our spirits all stirred up in this church, dear Lord. We're still a small church, dear God, but we want to do great things for you. We know that, that you are very powerful and you can give us the strength that we need. You can give us the guidance that we need, dear Lord, to reach the people in need in our area, dear God. I pray that you would please help us to do mighty works in your name, dear Lord. Stir us up. Help us not to be lazy. Help us not to, to be intimidated or scared, dear Lord, or, or to, to, to feel like we don't want to do something because it's a little bit uncomfortable, dear Lord. Help us just to push forward. Help us to realize that our life in this world is just like a vapor. It appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away, dear Lord. Help us to use that little length of the vapor we have here to, to, the, to the utmost that we can do the most work for you as possible in this life, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.